I am absolutely fascinated by members in my audience that can tell me that they can track their heritage back 500, 600, even 700 years. That blows my mind. Which is why I'm really happy to say that today's video is sponsored by MyHeritage. MyHeritage is a leading global service that allows one to look deep into the history of one's family. It has over 90 million users and 18 billion, that's with a B, searchable historical records. I started using this not that long ago, and it is so easy to create your own family tree. And that's really where the magic happens, because the program can then find information about your ancestors. If you do the same, perhaps you will also find some fascinating stories of what your ancestors did. And here's the best part. It comes with AI tech to repair, enhance, colorize, and even animate photos. I mean, you might be able to even walk away from this experience with pictures that you can frame. Because of this program, I was able to find a really great photo of my grandfather. Pretty handsome guy, huh? Then with a few clicks, I enhanced the picture, removed damages, and then even added an animation. It has been a really long time since I've seen my grandfather smile. Sign up today for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features that MyHeritage has to offer, which even includes a very convenient way to get DNA kits. If you decide to continue your subscription, just click the link below and you'll get a 50% discount. So what are you waiting for? Begin your journey into your own heritage today. Hello everybody out there, I am introducing a new series called The Art of War. I really want you to be my guest in what is going to be an interesting discussion about military history, events that really showed promise. A great attack, an impressive defense, masterful strategy, blunders, triumphs, good generals and bad generals. But first I want to explain what this is going to be and what this isn't. I'm going back to my original podcasting roots on this one. I want this to be an overview of interesting times, which is meant to appeal both to history buffs in terms of being fairly in-depth, but not to the point of extraneous minutia. At the same time, I want to entice those who are unfamiliar with the topic to perhaps take a deeper look. I'm going to leave the music and the visual effects to a minimum to really emphasize the history. Again, this is going back to my roots of what got me into podcasting in the first place. Just talking about some interesting times. And I'm really hoping I can get you lovely people in the audience to engage with discussion. YouTube is a great platform for that. It allows you to comment and counter comment. Which, by the way, having this back and forth with the audience is actually one of the most rewarding things I feel about podcasting in general. I mean, after all, it is podcasting on YouTube that has given me the opportunity to interact with people that otherwise I would have never met. And there are many things that I have learned that I would have not otherwise have picked up on. And, you know, I'm really kind of appreciative for that. So with that, let's get right to it. The first discussion is going to be about the defense of Baston. Now, to put this into perspective, this is a battle that has been glorified, immortalized, and you have to be a little careful with that. Sometimes the sensation and the emotion that goes into an event like this can overwhelm the objective findings of what actually really happened. I mean, after all, the defense of Baston, which is part of the larger Battle of the Bulge, is something that is portrayed in movies either directly or indirectly, and was featured really well from the perspective of the 101st Airborne Division in the HBO series Band of Brothers, which, in my humble, simple opinion, is really worth the watch, they did an exceptional job creating this series. Okay, with that said, let's begin with the large strategic picture. It is mid-December of 1944, we're entering into the tail end of the Second World War, and we're talking about the European theater of operations here. Germany, its allies, and the Axis powers in general are decisively losing the war. Axis forces have been kicked out of North Africa, they've been driven out of Sicily. They're then pushed up the Italian boot by September of 1944. A force that is mostly comprised of German troops is holding a strong defensive line at the level of Florence. But by December that same year, this force has been pushed even further north into the Po River Valley, 
Now the Eastern Front, that is where Axis forces are taking on the forces of the Soviet Union, is just an all-out nightmare. It's not just German divisions or corps that are getting destroyed. It is entire Axis armies and army groups that are getting annihilated. And mark my words, the Soviet juggernaut at this point is relentless. They definitely have a score to settle on this one. For the Axis, this is a critical situation. By December of 1944, Estonia has been retaken, portions of Lithuania have been invaded, or liberated, uh, depending on your point of view. Romania, which was a German ally, has been overrun, and a big portion of Hungary has been conquered. In fact, the vanguard Soviet divisions have actually managed to arrive at Warsaw, Poland, and have even managed to take portions of East Prussia. Oh, and just as a side note, and fair warning, there are going to be a lot of side notes, it wasn't just the, quote, Russians that were fighting on the Eastern Front. The Soviet army consisted of a whole host of different peoples. I mean, yes, you did have a lot of Russians, but you also had Latvians and Estonians and Ukrainians. I mean, heck, they even brought in people that had Mongolian descent from some of the Eastern territories. And this army had just absolutely horrendous casualties. So from my perspective, I think it's a good point to at least acknowledge that contribution. All right, that said, now we get to the Western Front. In June of 1944, the Allies land in Normandy in France. After a month of intensive fighting in the hedgerow country known as the Bocage, the Allies managed to break out. By mid-August, that is August 19th, 1944, Paris is liberated and the Germans are falling back to more defensive positions. But as they do so, they're doing everything they can to somehow stop the Allied advance. By September of 1944, the Allied High Command decides to back up Bernard Montgomery, the British commander, and his plan to end the war by Christmas. At least, that's how he sells it. Montgomery comes up with what he calls Operation Market Garden, which will turn out to be the largest airborne operation in history. What Bernard Montgomery comes up with is to use paratroopers to land behind enemy lines to capture strategic bridges in Holland. Now, the bridges that the paratroopers are meant to capture are located. Folks, I'm going to try my absolute best to pronounce this, but, you know, I have many faults and pronunciation is one of them. The bridges are located in Eindhoven, with its bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal, Nijmegen, with its bridge over the Vaal River, and finally the city of Arnhem, with its key strategic bridges over the Lower Rhine. Once the bridges are secured, it is then time for the armored British 30 Corps to simply roll over the bridges, enter into the industrialized Ruhr Valley, and bring the German war-making machine to a halt. Operation Market Garden, unfortunately, would go down in the annals of history as a fail. What can I tell you? It looked good on paper, but the application didn't work out. The German High Command, just at the very last second, decided to park a crack SS Panzer Division at Arnhem. And the poor paratroopers who landed there going up against these massive tanks with only light weaponry, well, that's just not going to work out. It's, as they would say, no bueno. And so the situation on the Western Front after this debacle basically began to stagnate, which brings us up to December of 1944. So at this point, the Western Allies have arrived at the Rhine River, or just about at certain parts. But the big problem is logistics. Now, logistics is what Dan Carlin so eloquently says in his podcast, the less sexy part of warfare. It's not about the battles and the confrontations, the generals, the decisive actions. It's about number crunching and bean counting, in some cases perhaps even literally. But I'll tell you this right now, no matter what kind of army you have, what kind of condition and how well equipped it is, whether or not you have the will to fight or high morale, if you don't have logistics, you're going to fail. So just write that down, all you would-be conquerors out there. Logistics is the reason why Rommel did not do very well in North Africa after he had taken Tobruk. He just didn't have enough supplies to really go any further. The opposite end of that is that people who are masters of logistics can actually accomplish quite incredible feats. For example, 
1864, William Tecumseh Sherman managed to detach his army from Union supply, blitz his way across Georgia, took out Atlanta, and made it all the way to Savannah, Georgia, which I believe he presented to Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas gift. But he knew that he had to keep his army moving. Khalid ibn al-Walid, probably one of the best generals in history that most people have never heard about, took his army across the Syrian desert during the great Arab expansion of the 7th century, and the way he did it was ingenious. He used camels as a walking source of water. This allowed him to appear suddenly and unexpectedly on a position on the Byzantine front that nobody thought anybody could actually even get there. Khalid then proceeded to simply just roll up the Roman line. So bottom line, the logistics are critical. And this is what the Allies faced in December of 1944. They were kind of at the tail end of their logistical supply line. What they really needed was a functional port. The nearest one that was decent was the city of Antwerp. But the problem is, is that when the Germans pulled out of there, the fighting between them and the Allies had caused considerable damage. The port was not exactly working very well. Plus, sailing the North Sea in wintertime is not a great idea. So a lot of supplies were being brought in all the way back from Normandy, which is about 700 kilometers or about 450 miles. So, for the most part, the Western Allies at this point were bedding down for the wintertime. They wanted to wait for the logistical situation to improve to begin offensive actions, most likely in January or February of 1945. So, in the north, in portions of Holland and Belgium, you had Bernard Montgomery with his 21st Army Group, and in the south, along a front that ran through Belgium, Luxembourg, and France, you had the American army under the command of Omar Bradley and his 12th Army Group. Just as a side note for the people at home that are listening to this as a podcast and are not familiar with the way that an army is divided, you have divisions, which consist of anywhere between 10 to 30,000 soldiers. Two to about seven divisions coming together form a corps. Several corps come together to form an army. Several armies come together to form an army group. Now, just about at the line that divided the 21st British Army Group in the north and the 12th American Army Group in the south, you have the Ardennes Forest. Of all the places that anybody could pick to have a fight, this is probably one of the worst for a mechanized army of the Second World War. It is a place that is heavily wooded, there are deep ravines, Visibility is at a minimum, there's multiple rivers that crisscross the area, and there are few roads, and of the roads that do exist, they're pretty poor. To make matters worse, the weather was terrible. Winter was coming, and this particular winter of 1944 was probably one of the harshest on record. Of all the places and of all the times, you would have to be absolutely nuts to attack here. At least, that's what the Allied High Command thought. And perhaps you can't exactly fault them for this. Germany at this time was having a lot of difficulty finding supplies of any sort. They were desperately low on everything, from manpower to material to uh, even fuel. Even Bernard Montgomery was quoted as saying, and again, he said this on the eve of the Battle of the Bulge, shortages of German manpower, equipment, and resources preclude any offensive action on their part. So in essence, the Allied High Command was not expecting any action to come this way. Thus, the troops that they positioned in the Ardennes Forest along this portion of the front were men that were either new, they were raw recruits and green, or they were men that were battle-weary and they needed time for rest and relaxation, so to speak. The Germans, on the other hand, were anticipating this moment for some time. Adolf Hitler being the gambler that he was, whose mindset was indoctrinated into offensive actions, wanted to launch an attack. What he came up with was called Operation Wacht am Rhein, that is, Watch on the Rhine. Secrecy was absolutely key here. Most of his high command was left out of the loop. Only a select few that were going to be involved were notified. And the field commanders, that is the generals with boots on the ground doing the actual fighting, weren't informed of what they're going to be doing until the day prior to the action. To the credit of German preparations, this operation was assembled exceptionally 
The German high command was able to create a very powerful army group B under the command of Walter Model, and then they managed to position it at the Ardennes forest without the Allies figuring it out. This was done so remarkably well that the buildup of men and tanks and guns and materiel, and here we are talking about 400,000 men, along with about 550 tanks and about 670 tank destroyers. All of this buildup was done without Allied air reconnaissance, which was pretty formidable, discovering it. That is a feat unto itself. Now, Army Group B was divided up into three major components. In the north, you had the 6th Panzer Army under Sept Dietrich. In the middle, you had the 5th Panzer Army under Hasso von Monteufel. And in the south, you had the 7th Army under Erich Brandenburger. The components that made up this army group were the best that Germany could offer. The troops had winter camouflage. The tanks, which we'll get to in a bit, were the best that Germany could produce. What's more, the German high command had picked this particular moment to launch the attack because they knew that the weather was going to be just absolutely terrible. You see, the Germans had these weather stations up in Norway, which allowed them to kind of predict what the weather in the rest of Europe was going to be like either hours or days later. They knew that this nasty cold front was coming in, and that would bring a lot of snow and cloud cover. On the ground, this would make things absolutely miserable. Visibility, which was already pretty bad, would be reduced even further. So why on earth would you possibly want to launch an attack in the middle of this? It all comes down to air power. The Allies had it, the Germans didn't. In fact, at this point in time, the Allies didn't have just air superiority, they had air supremacy. This incoming cold front would effectively negate Allied air power. The Germans wanted a ground war. They were going to be pumping in a ton of troops, and again, they were going to be bringing in the best tanks that they could produce. And keep in mind that at the beginning of this offensive, Germany really did have that dominance. They had brought in 29 divisions, of which 12 were armored. As I stated before, that's about 400,000 men, but it should be emphasized that these are some of the best troops that Germany could afford. We're talking about a lot of SS formations here. And these soldiers were backed up by about 500 tanks and about 600 tank destroyers. Now let's compare that to the 12th American Army Group. This consisted of just about a quarter million men, but again many of them were either raw recruits or they were battle wary, and they only had about 500 tanks along with about 500 tank destroyers. Now at the beginning of Operation Wacht am Rhein, the Germans had a clear idea of what they wanted to accomplish with the offensive. Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army was given the task to advance very quickly to the Meuse River, cross the river into more open, that is, less wooded territory, and then rapidly move on and capture the port city of Antwerp. That was the main objective of the entire offensive, to seize that port. Von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army was to race alongside the 6th Army, just to the south of it, providing support for the advance with the main goal of taking the city of Brussels. Brandenburger's 7th Army was also to provide support, but its goal was not so much to advance deep into Allied territory, but rather to establish a strong defensive line. That is, to protect the southern flank while the other two armies continued on with their offensive. Brandenburger was there to stop any counterattack that would be coming from the south. Now, if they could have accomplished this goal, this would have accomplished multiple things. First, it would have divided the American and the British Army groups, it would have left the British Army Group completely isolated and cut off from supplies. And perhaps the most important thing is that by taking the city of Antwerp, it would have deprived the Allies of what they needed most, a major port that would allow them to re-establish their line of logistics. A significant Allied offensive across the Rhine and into Germany itself would not have been very feasible unless they had a port that could bring in fresh supplies almost directly to the front. And if the offensive was successful enough, it might have pushed the Americans back to another defensive position. In the mind of Adolf Hitler, this probably would have brought the Western Allies to the negotiating table. At the very least, it would make them look fairly weak in the eyes of the Soviets. And who knows, maybe the Soviet Union and the Third Reich would then be able to sign some sort of ceasefire. 
In reality, this probably would not have happened, but hey, what can I say? Hitler was being very optimistic. The Ardennes Forest was, after all, the place in 1940 where the German Wehrmacht managed to achieve its breakthrough and then went on to encircle the Allied Expeditionary Force. And the subsequent victory basically led to the fall of France and managed to kick the British off the continent. And I'm actually very curious what you think about this offensive. Was this a high water mark of German military planning and execution? Or can we attribute this German victory more to the fact that the Allies just didn't have a very good response to it, that they were very disorganized, and when they had the opportunity to counterattack, they didn't really take advantage of it. Either way, when Adolf Hitler's generals got word of Operation Wacht am Rhein, they were not very supportive, to say the least. Almost all of them, from a military perspective, felt that this was not something that was feasible. They cited the fact that the Ardennes Offensive in 1940 was hard enough to plan, and that was done under favorable weather conditions. This, on the other hand, was going up against people that were in a fixed position in the middle of winter, in the middle of a storm. But Hitler was the consummate autocrat. He had already discounted everything that his generals had told him, and no matter what, the offensive would now continue. Speed was going to be the key factor to this offensive. They had to stick to a schedule. The German high command figured that they would be able to take the American and the British forces by surprise, which they did, but they also figured that the Allies would take approximately three days to have a concerted counterattack. Now, before we get into the actual offensive itself, I really want to talk about what the Germans were bringing to bear. They were bringing in some of their best tanks. Now, the best example that I could come up with is that German tanks are kind of like iPhones, at least in terms of classification. You have your iPhone 1s, you have your iPhone 2s. At the time of this recording, I think we're all the way up to 14. And for anybody that's upgraded from like a 7 to, say, like a 12, you know that there's a vast improvement in terms of capabilities. German tanks were kind of the same way. The German classification was done in terms of Mark, like you had the Mark I, the Mark II, all the way up to the Mark VI, and what I'd like to refer to as the Mark VI Pro. Now, the Mark I and the Mark II are considered light tanks. They don't look formidable at all. To me, personally, it looks like somebody mounted a turret on top of a Volkswagen with treads. They were both designed before the war broke out, and they don't look like they could hold up against any other tank out there. And by the way, not very many of them were built. By the time you get to the Mark III's, you're finally seeing something that actually looks like what you would think a World War II tank should look like. This is a medium tank that has reasonable armor and armament for the time. It is designed to be fast. It is designed for Blitzkrieg. These are the ones that helped invade Poland in 1939 and saw service throughout the war. A lot of them were built. The Mark IV was also considered to be a medium tank. It weighed about 25 tons. It had decent armor and armament. A lot of these were built, uh, by some estimates, almost 9,000. Thus, there were a lot of variants. But this was the last Panzer Mark that was designed before the war broke out. And you got to keep in mind that Germany was restricted by the Treaty of Versailles in what they could design. So a lot of the variants of this design could not hold its own against other tanks, especially the Russian T-34. By the time you get to the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans are throwing in the best stuff that they can bring. These tanks were designed after the war started. They were not restricted in any way. And just as a side note, also like Apple's operating system, at least under Steve Jobs, the Germans would name all their tanks after the big cats. The Mark V is considered the Panther. This thing is a beast. It is 45 tons. It carries a 75 millimeter gun with a very long barrel, which makes it kind of like a sniper in terms of what it can do. Because of that long barrel, it can shoot its projectiles with high velocity and hit a target a mile and a half away with accuracy. That is insane. It's also really well protected. Most variants, the front has 88 millimeters of sloped armor, making it pretty difficult to take out. The Germans are going to throw about 400 of these into the fight. Now, if you think that the Panther is formidable, wait till we get to the Mark VI. The Germans will refer to the Mark VI as the Tiger, or the Tiger I. 
This one clocks in at 57 tons. It has 100 millimeters of frontal armor and carries an 88 millimeter gun. And for reference, 88 millimeters is what the Germans would use in their anti-aircraft guns. This thing is designed from the ground up to be a tank killer, and the Germans are going to throw hundreds of these into the offensive. And now we get to the Tiger II, which I affectionately refer to as the Mark VI Pro. It actually wasn't called that, but this was the epitome of German tanks during the war. This is a 70-ton behemoth. Some variants had as high as 185 millimeters of front armor. They carried a standard 88 millimeter gun, and some carried a 100 millimeter gun. This was about as formidable of a tank as you can get. Some people argue that this was probably the best tank of the war. Again, the Germans would refer to it as the Tiger II. The other name that they would give it was the Königs Tiger. König in German means king. That said, one of the biggest downsides to the Mark VI and the Mark VI Pro was that they were extremely expensive. As far as tanks go, these were like Porsches. In fact, I believe it was Dr. Porsche that actually helped design the Tiger II. So this is what the Germans would bring to bear in the offensive, and they would take all of this equipment and concentrate it into a relatively small area for their axis of advance. In terms of firepower on the ground, they were looking pretty good. Their biggest problem was lack of supply. In many cases, they just didn't have enough fuel. In fact, I've read some places that a lot of the German tank commanders were given siphon hoses. So if they came across an enemy supply dump or a downed enemy tank, they could literally suck the fuel out of it and keep going. So with that, on December 16th at 5.30 a.m., under a dense cover of clouds, the offensive begins. The Germans start with a 90-minute artillery barrage before their forces pour over an 87-mile or 140-kilometer front. This area of the front is defended by the American 8th Corps, which is taken completely by surprise. In many areas, soldiers are hit extremely hard and they are forced to fall back. Other units are quickly surrounded and destroyed. But at the same time, there are places where the Germans meet up with just absolutely fierce resistance. Now keep in mind that the Germans are on a very tight schedule here. According to their own plans, they have to make it to the Meuse River in approximately two days. Almost immediately after the offensive begins, the Germans are behind schedule. The 6th Panzer Army under Dietrich in the northern sector of the attack, which should be the lead element in the attack, gets stalled in an area called the Elsenberg Ridge right off the bat. The American 99th Infantry, which took the high ground, stops the German 67th Corps dead in its tracks. A little south of that ridge, at a city called St. Vith, the American 106th Infantry Division does the same to the crack German 1st SS Panzer Corps. St. Vith, by the way, will hold out for five days against German attacks before it's evacuated on the 21st. But that is going to be five critical days. You can kind of already tell where this offensive is going. The Germans are in such a rush in order to accomplish their objectives that they don't even have time for POWs. In the northern sector, in a place called Malmedy, 84 American POWs who have surrendered, they are unarmed, are brought into an open field and members of the Kampfgruppe Piper, this is a Waffen-SS unit, just gun them down. Which, no matter which way you look at this, it is a war crime, and when word of this gets back to the Allied line, it only hardens resolve. Whatever resistance the Germans were facing before, now they're going to be dealing with even more. Now in the southern sector, Brandenburger's 7th Army is also on the offensive, but it too is delayed in capturing its objectives. It's only really in the middle sector with von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army that the Germans gain significant ground. They take on the American 28th and 106th Infantry Divisions and are able to inflict substantial losses. These two divisions are going to be forced to fall back. The next day, December 17th, Eisenhower orders all reserve forces to the front. He commands all incoming units to take up position in places that are either well entrenched or well fortified, or in the case of Baston, a place where several roads come together. 
The Allies at this point are taking on a very strong defensive strategy. The, the idea is for containment. Now, the Germans had kind of anticipated this. They knew that the uh, Allies were going to be bringing in reinforcements as soon as they could. So the German High Command had decided to send some of their soldiers behind enemy lines, dress them up as American MP, that is, military police, and then have them do acts of sabotage, blow up bridges, and then misdirect traffic. Now, imagine for a second what that would be like if you were an American GI. You have to get to a certain destination. Time is of the essence. You're going to an area that you're not familiar with. You're using fairly rudimentary maps. The roads are fairly crummy. It's snowing. There's no such thing as GPS. Then you come across somebody that looks like they're in a position of authority. They're directing you in a certain direction. I mean, you're not going to question that, right? And before you even know it, you are miles from where you need to be. You have to admit, this is a pretty cunning move from the German perspective. Anyway, getting back to Bastogne, as I'd mentioned before, this is a place where several roads come together. For the Allies, this is going to be prime real estate to defend. The 101st Airborne Division, along with components of the 10th Armored Division and the 969th Artillery Battalion, an all-African-American unit, are all deployed to Bastogne. The reinforcements that the Americans and the British are throwing into this don't start arriving on the front until December 18th and 19th. During this time, the Germans, despite being seriously delayed, are bringing up reinforcements, are neutralizing Allied strongpoints, and are making gains on all fronts, especially in the center. December 19th, by the way, Eisenhower meets up with Bradley and Patton and Montgomery at Verdun to figure out what they're going to do next. They come up with plans for a concerted counterattack. Patton is going to come up with his third army from the south, and U.S. and Commonwealth forces are going to come in from the north. The 19th, by the way, is the same day that the lead components of the German 5th Panzer Army, again under von Mann Teufel, come into contact with the strong defensive perimeter that's been established around Bastogne. You have three strong columns of troops all converging at this point. Therefore, components of the 2nd Panzer Division, the Panzer Lair Division, and the 26th Volksgrenadier Division are all moving in on this one spot. Now, while Bastogne for the Germans is not really an objective, it's simply a waypoint towards their objective, again, crossing the Meuse River and getting to Antwerp. So when they find that the defense there is too formidable, they simply decide to just go around. The Germans, to some extent, had a certain degree of flexibility in their maneuvers. They would use combined arms in their attack groups, known as Kampf groups. You had infantry that was defended by half-tracks that were reinforced by tanks, and usually there'd be a component of combat engineers that could blow up obstacles in their path. When used together effectively, which the Germans had really mastered after fighting on several fronts, what you'd end up with is an effective fighting force that had flexibility in order to achieve their objectives. And this is something that the Germans did really well throughout the war. They emphasized that need for flexibility. They allowed their field commanders on the ground itself to decide what action needed to be done in order to accomplish the overall goal. Now, this didn't necessarily apply on a strategic or a political level where Adolf Hitler decided to essentially subvert all of his generals. But on a tactical level, I would have to say that the Germans knew what they were doing. On December 20th, the Germans continued to maneuver their way around Bastogne, taking out any Allied strongpoints that might be outside of the defensive perimeter. For example, at Nouvelle, a small village just about 10 miles north of Bastogne, the 10th Armored was able to hold out against the 2nd Panzer Division as long as it could until it was just simply flattened by a German artillery barrage. The 10th Armored was not alone. There were several other units in the area of varying sizes that were all being pushed back into the defensive perimeter of Baston. It was becoming a rallying point. Luckily, the man that they put in charge for the defense of Baston also knew what he was doing. He was a general by the name of Anthony McCulloch. On the 19th of December, he was made acting commander of the 101st Airborne Division, but I want to emphasize that it wasn't just the 101st that was defending Baston. There were several different units, or at least portions of units, that were defending this perimeter. 
By the 20th of December, McCulloch had organized his men into several different units that could effectively defend his line. He had also pulled back his armor and his artillery to a more defensive position. That way they could act as a reserve force that could alleviate any place that was under pressure. So when the Germans began their probing attacks with their Kampf groups, their infantry would be met by combined machine gun fire from fixed American positions. And when they brought their panzers to bear, they would be counterattacked by American tank destroyers. McCulloch also recognized that most of the attack would be coming from the east, which is where he deployed most of his men. By the evening of December 20th, he had managed to stabilize the line around the town. But by the 21st, the Germans had managed to complete their encirclement of Baston. At this point, no more supplies were getting in. McCulloch and his men were now on their own. The siege of Baston had begun. Now, most times in history, if you're a soldier in an army that has been surrounded, that is usually a reason to panic or at least have some reservations. Encirclement and warfare usually does not work out to a good thing. And you don't have to go that far back in history to come up with some good examples. Look at the Soviet armies, that is plural, that were surrounded at Kiev during the early phases of Operation Barbarossa. Or perhaps the German 6th Army that was surrounded at Stalingrad and destroyed. If you, I don't know, want to go really old school on this one, you can go as far back as the Battle of Cannae, which was Hannibal's masterpiece. The Carthaginian general managed to take his army, which was smaller, I might add, and completely surround a massive Roman army. At the end of that day, there was almost nothing left of those Romans. In the case of Baston, however, the man that was in charge happened to be a paratrooper. They were used to being surrounded. As a result, he was able to function very adequately under the situation. General McCulloch had several advantages, and he used them really well. One of the biggest problems he faced was lack of supplies. Baston just happened to be a stockpile. From the very beginning, all the ammunition and food and medical supplies were rationed very effectively. The general would also take whatever forces were coming into his perimeter and establish these ad hoc fighting units. This gave him a certain degree of flexibility and also a certain degree of organization. He also kept his artillery and his armor, that is his tanks, in the very center instead of spreading them along the line. In this way, he had a reserve force that could attack in just about any direction and could respond to any threat as it appeared. The general had internal lines, and he was going to use them to their full effect. As I have mentioned probably a dozen times before, Baston is the place where all the roads come together. Now the general was going to use those very same roads to rapidly deploy this reserve force to any place along his perimeter that was threatened. And these attacks would come quickly and often. It was only a matter of how severe they were going to be. On the 21st of December, the Eastern Line was hit in several different locations. The 26th Volksgrenadier threw everything they had at the village of Foy, and the Panzer Lair Division came in from the south and attacked the line along an area near the village of Neff. While the perimeter did crumble in certain locations, both attacks were pushed back. Now, outside of the pocket of Baston, the Germans were making some serious gains. Also on the 21st, St. Vith was evacuated, the 6th Army under Dietrich was able to move deeper into Allied territory, the 6th Panzer Army under von Manteuffel was making gains on getting closer and closer to the Meuse, and Brandenburger's 7th Army had established a very strong defensive position along the southern portion of the offensive. Now the very next day, December 22nd, is one of those days that has its highlight in the annals of military history. Imagine this scenario in your mind. A small contingent of German soldiers comes up to the Baston perimeter. They're holding up a little white flag and they have a message for General McCulloch. The message is coming in from the commander of the 47th Panzer Corps, a General Heinrich von Lutwitz. It's addressed to the USA commander of the encircled town of Baston. It basically says that, hey, you know, we know you're surrounded, we know that you're low on supplies, and we don't want any more unnecessary bloodshed, so why don't you do the right thing and just surrender? McCulloch's response comes in a single word. Nuts. 
The Germans don't quite understand what that response means, but the rest of the Allied forces understand it perfectly. Bastogne is either going to hold or it's going to go down fighting. That one-word response would later become an international sensation. You know, I think that McCulloch probably had some leeway to be a little cocky there. His men were able to dish out more casualties than they received. He had a good organization structure. Plus, he still had communication established with the outside world, and he knew that reinforcements were on their way. Specifically, General George S. Patton with his 3rd Army were on their way in, and Patton was going to, as he would call it, drive like hell. When the Germans figured out that nuts meant no in McCulloch's own sarcastic way, they began to launch attacks, this time coming from the western side. The attack began late on the 22nd, and then again on the 23rd with a full-blown artillery bombardment. This attack on the 23rd was devastating. The Germans brought in the 39th Fusiliers and attacked a salient in the Bastogne perimeter, which was around the small village of Flamierge. At least, I think that's how you say it. The men in that sector took serious casualties. McCulloch eventually ordered them to fall back to a much more defensive position. In doing so, he abandoned the village, but he also managed to shorten the line in which he had to defend. The Germans were able to push the Americans back that day, but overall they were getting frustrated that the city of Bastogne had not fallen yet. So, their response was to bring in even more reinforcements. Specifically, they brought in the 15th Panzer Grenadier. This entire division that the Wehrmacht had brought in was to serve a dual purpose. One task was to attack the southern portion of the defense perimeter at Bastogne, and the other was to keep Patton at bay. Again, he was coming up from the south. Now, very ominously, at least for the German high command, the 23rd was also the day that the skies began to clear. Allied fighter bombers began to fill up the sky. Any German tank that was stranded or had run out of gas at this point became a very easy target. Not to mention entire German columns, which at this point in the offensive were running out of fuel left and right. The Germans had to shift their tactics at this point to only maneuver at night to avoid getting bombed or strafed. For General McCulloch, this was a godsend. On that day, 241 transport aircraft parachuted in supplies. Not all of them landed within his sector, some of them even landed in German hands, but the bulk of it did. The bottom line was that the man had what he needed to continue fighting. December 24th, Christmas Eve, was a relatively quiet day for the forces around Bastogne. Both sides maneuvered a little bit and there were some skirmishes, but overall there was no major action. That said, another 160 plane loads of supplies were parachuted in. Meanwhile, for the Battle of the Bulge as a whole, this was the high water mark of the German offensive. On the 24th of December, the 2nd Panzer Division of the 47th Corps was able to reach the town of Sell. This town is located approximately 5 to 6 miles to the Meuse River. This river, again, was the objective that the Germans had to get to on the second day of the offensive. What's important to emphasize here is that if they were able to cross that river, what lies ahead is all flat country, or at least relatively flat compared to what they had just gone through. It was ideal territory for the tanks that they had brought up to blitz their way all the way to Antwerp. But it also should be emphasized that they probably would not have had a good chance even if they crossed the river. The Allied High Command had been pouring in reinforcements. What had once been approximately a quarter million men in the sector had now bloomed into over half a million. Now think about that for a second because that is a logistical feat of engineering unto itself. It's pretty impressive that they were able to bring up so many troops in such a short period of time. Now on Christmas Day, December 25th, the Germans renewed their attack. This was going to be the closest the Germans got to bringing down Bastogne. The 15th Panzer Grenadier attacked in a two-pronged assault with a combination of infantry and armor. The attack came from the west, starting at approximately 4 o'clock in the morning. It was preceded by your standard artillery barrage. Initially, the Germans were able to achieve success. The two-prong assault managed to rip a hole in the Bastogne perimeter, 
and then German infantry and armor poured through the breach in order to exploit it. The men defending the line had to fall back, but they made the Germans pay for every inch. The American troops had set up strong defensive positions with machine gun nests that were covered by mortar fire. And at this point, they had been resupplied by air, so they actually had ammunition to fight back with. Now, one misconception that a lot of people have is that they think that it was only Bastogne that was within this defensive perimeter. In actuality, the defensive perimeter that McCulloch had decided to defend had a radius of anywhere between 7 to 10 miles. It was a big enough circle that it would encompass several smaller villages. Each one of these villages were reinforced and barricaded. They, they became strong points. The Germans needed to take very precious time to reduce each and every one of these strong points, and in this particular German attack, they came face to face with the well-entrenched defenders at a village called Hemrul, which is about three and a half to four miles northwest of Bastogne. The German attack began to falter, it began to lose steam, and when McCulloch saw this, he scrambled to put together a counterattack. He created a mechanized infantry unit which combined a lot of tanks, supported by artillery. Again, you know, he had that kind of centralized reserve force. McCulloch decided to call this thing Team Cherry, and he just threw it into a counterattack against the Germans. Now, keep in mind that the fighting had gone on for so long that the sun was now up, which meant that McCulloch could also call in air support. This concerted counterattack, both on land and also from the air, just destroyed the German offensive. Imagine again in your head for the situation. You had P-47s just swooping in from the air and just strafing the German lines. You had them blowing up German tanks left and right. By the end of that day, it was very clear that the defenders of Bastogne had managed to hold the line. The Germans had to fall back to their original position. There was also the fact that Patton and his third army were now only three miles from the southern portion of the Bastogne perimeter. The next day on December 26th, the Allies managed to bring in 289 transport airplanes to resupply Bastogne. Now think about that for a second, the fact that they could bring in so many airplanes to resupply just one town. It goes to show just how much of an advantage that the Allies had uh, compared to the Germans. December 26th was also the day that Patton reached Bastogne and the siege was finally lifted. Now just as a kudos to Patton, he had done something fairly impressive with this. He had taken his third army, taken it off a fighting front, maneuvered it over a hundred miles in the middle of winter, and gone right into another fight without any type of resupply or rest. From what I've read, that had never been done before in the history of warfare. Even though Bastogne was now quote-unquote saved, fighting would continue for another two weeks around the town. You see, what happened was is that Hitler changed the aim of this offensive. Instead of taking Antwerp, he now wanted his generals to just take Bastogne. He knew that this offensive had failed. In fact, he would call it off on the 28th. But I guess he wanted to have like a symbolic victory if nothing else. The Wehrmacht was not going to get their prize. The Commonwealth forces would now counterattack from the north, and the Americans would counterattack from the south. By January 25th, the lines had gone back to where they were before the offensive. The price for this entire attack would come out to about 90,000 American casualties and approximately 70 to 100,000 German. But the Germans could just simply not replace any of these losses. In terms of men and materiel, they were done. On the Western Front, Germany could no longer go on the offensive. And many people argue that the losses that Germany sustained in the Ardennes in December of 1944 would only hasten the destruction of the Third Reich. And clearly, they had to surrender just a few months later. Now, going back to the siege of Bastogne itself, I've come up with a couple of questions that I think would foster some decent conversation here. Number one, do you think that the defense of Bastogne by McCulloch, was it good? Was it bad? Did the guy just get really lucky? Number two, when von Manteuffel was going through with his 5th Panzer Army, do you think it was a mistake for him to simply go around Bastogne? Or should he have taken the time to actually conquer the city before he moved on? And finally, number three, 
considering all of the difficulties that the Germans had in terms of logistics, lack of supplies, do you think that in their offensive the Germans could have gone further? That is, are there things that they could have done better? Or was their high water mark simply all that they could really achieve? Alright folks, that ends this episode. If you've made it this far, I really appreciate your time. If you have a little bit of extra time to write some responses to some of the questions that I've posed, or if you just have some thoughts, perhaps maybe I got something wrong here, please, I would love to hear it in the comments. Also, if there's any other topics that you want me to cover in the Art of War, just, you know, let me know. So again, until next time, thank you again for listening.